And we're live. Welcome to Music Matters 2020. I'm your host, Jason Tram, and we're delighted that you can join us for our unique podcast community. Please remember to subscribe on YouTube and hit that bell icon for the most up-to-date information on upcoming guests and topics, and like our videos and share them and help our community grow. Uh, the more of us that uh, join in this conversation about the arts and about music, the better. Please remember to chat in any questions we have of our guests. We love to have uh, members of the community join us, and uh, we always love those conversations and seeing where they take us. We have a wonderful guest today, a fabulous composer, Dan Forrest, who's um, one of the most renowned choral composers and instrumental composers in the country right now. He's highly published and uh, his works are have secured a very major place in the repertoire and we're delighted that he's with us today. Welcome, Dan. Thank you, Jason. I'm so glad to be here. We have a crazy weather day today here on the East Coast. So uh, how are things in uh, South Carolina? Yeah, this morning, uh, the power was blinking on and off, and the wind was whistling through our front door, even though it was closed. Um, but that's all kind of passed through now, and things are good, and the sun came out. So all is well. I'm well the happy sun to came out. Well, it hasn't, it's rained here all day. But it's like 40 degrees and rainy. It's been a real kind of dreary, but lots of leaves falling, so it's not so bad. And our internet was blinking a little bit today, too. So just to keep everything interesting, <laughs> it's amazing yeah. how dependent we are on the internet. It's a little windy here, so hopefully it doesn't blow any more trees down onto cables or lines or anything. <laughs> Good so far. So, Dan, you have such an interesting uh, compositional background. Um, tell us about um, what music. Uh, so, you write for such a wide variety of ensemble types and for for large, uh, like large uh, scale pieces, multi movement works, for smaller uh, church choir works. Um, how do you find? How do you thrive on such diversity? I, well, my background um, is a lot of church choral music. So I, um, especially growing up, was very, very familiar with that whole scene of smaller choirs, volunteer choirs, limited rehearsal time. Um, and then when I gained some knowledge and skill, um, I tried to apply that toward how can I solve the, the musical problems that need to be solved here so that I can just write things that work really well um, and don't cause problems for that kind of of choir and just make it as usable and, and like bulletproof <laughs> as possible. Um, but then my background also includes um, higher education and um, various uh, training and then ultimately a, a doctorate from the University of Kansas. So I have that academic side to me too. And then um, I was primarily a pianist um, through a master's degree that I finished in that. But at the same time I finished that. I was um, really wanting to be where the singing was, not just where all the pianists were. <laughs> and then um, I did, I, for my doctorate, I studied with uh, James Barnes, who is a renowned wind band composer. So there's all these points on my map, so to speak, and then I just kind of triangulate in between all of those, and I end up with my hands in a lot of pots, I think. But I love it. I love all of it. And you, you also compose for wind bands and instrumental ensembles as well. Is that correct? Yeah, I do, um, because of that work with Jim Barnes there at Kansas. He Before I, I went to study with him, I thought wind band was probably my least favorite ensemble in the world. And then <laughs> he helped me understand what was going in, going on there and uh, and how not to write for it and how to write for it more successfully. And yeah, I, I grew to really love it. What are some of your earliest experiences as, as an artist, as a musician? Um, so you grew up as a singer and a pianist and um, in church choirs. Did you also play in orchestras and... Um as well um i was only a pianist I, my my punchline is that i say i was a pianist long before i was a musician <laughs> and we all know pianists like that <laughs> that was me i was one um yeah i wasn't much of a singer really still i'm not the truth be told um but i just love the voice and love what it's capable of i was always um at the piano i was always the accompanist for for choirs in, uh, in high school and college and um, in a church as well. So I was around singers a lot. Um, but for one, I, as any conductor knows, for better or for worse, the pianist is usually the one who's really truly in charge of tempo. <laughs> um, so I got kind of a feel of um, not just the power of that position, but also just the, the importance of it and, and how to work with a conductor and how to listen to the choir and keep, make, keep my eye on what the conductor he or she was doing. And, um, how to put all that together. So that, I think that gave me a sense for ensemble playing in a way that most, I mean, a lot of pianists might not have had as much opportunity for. So, 
I, I love when I speak to different composers. It's always so interesting to hear the backgrounds and um, how everyone synthesizes that that knowledge into their body of work. And uh, we've had quite a few composers that I love to just kind of just pick their brains because such interesting uh, people. And um, so when you compose, um, wh how do you find inspiration? Um, what, what, what grabs you first? Is it the text or the music or does it depend on the piece? Um, for me, it's text first almost all the time. Yeah, I, I want to set text, not use it. Um, I think that's an important distinction to be made. Um, and much less, I don't want to ab use, abuse it. Um, I, I want the, the music to feel like it was there in the text all along. And that maybe the job of the composer is just to sort of pull back a little curtain um, that was that was hiding something that we didn't see, and, and then here are these notes, and they were there just just waiting to be heard. Um, I'm not. I, I'm a pretty. Uh, I don't know how to say that. I'm somewhat of a stoic person. I don't necessarily wear my heart on my sleeve all the time. Um, I certainly have my moments and certain things that I get passionate about. I'm sure, but. Um, I think a lot of people picture composers as um, feeling things really deeply and then always writing as an outflow of how they feel at the moment. And for me, I can feel a text really deeply um, regardless of whether it's how I personally feel at the moment or whether it's where I am or how I'm, where, where my position in life is at the moment or however you want to say that. I feel like it's my, it's my service to the text and my service to the musicians and the audience to try to, to pull back the layers of that text to find um, music that, like I said, hopefully just feels like it was there all along and was just waiting to be unearthed um, out of that text that's there. Now, sometimes I certainly do bring my own emotions to the table or my own musical inspirations, whatever I've been listening to or something. Um, but most more often than anything else, I hope that I'm just finding notes that fit the text such that, um, I mean, I, I love choral music because of the, the, the whole being more than the sum of the parts. Um, I've used this analogy elsewhere that people who have <laughs> zoomed with me this summer may have heard me say this before, but, um, if there's, if there's like a, a value that we could put on the text, um, let's say on a scale of one to 10, it's a nine. And let's say that I'm going to write music for that text and the communicative or expressive value there is an eight. Um, let's say I got a B that day, you know? Um, so somehow when those two come together and we have music plus text, they add up to more. So the, the, the music that was eight and the text that was nine, if we listen to them or, or read them on their own, we add them together and hear a text setting that's, that's musical. And somehow we have like 24, you know? <laughs> And there's this this magic and this mystery of where did that seven come from? Like I'm having an experience that I can't fully account for. That's what makes me want to do choral music and not just be a pianist. And that's what keeps um, choral musicians coming back to rehearsal and keeps choral conductors um, wanting to conduct another piece and do another concert. You know, it, it's that that little bit of magic that we can't explain um, when a when a piece is written well. And like I like that's where that, that idea comes in of if I can pull out music that was already there, that's when I think the whole becomes more than the sum of the parts. And, and we all want to be in the room where that's happening. How do you find good texts to write? Um, you've been, you, you're a very prolific writer. How do you find new texts? Uh, do you write your own texts or you mostly draw from other people's works? And how do you find collaborators? I am not a poet by any stretch. Um, I'm a vicious poetry critic, <laughs> which is kind of a dangerous combination. Um, so yeah, it, it's few and far between the, the, of, the, of all the texts that I look at or have sent to me or whatever that I, that I hear singing to me. I, I have to feel like there's some music there in the notes. And if I can't, then I'm just not the one to, to set that to music. So uh, I, I say no a lot. Um, both to pieces that people or texts that people might send or point me to um, or even things that I find on my own. It, it's pretty rare that I find something, but I try to only set a text that I, I really hear music in that I think I can contribute that kind of magic to. So how do I find them? Um, I do a lot of Google searching <laughs> um, and it's needles in huge haystacks, but, but things show up here and there. And um, that, there's not really a pattern that emerges, I don't think, for, oh, this is the place where I just find wonderful tech. I'm just always on the lookout. I'm, I'm constantly scavenging and looking under rocks and you know, 
for little bits of poetry or prose or, or snippets or inscriptions on monuments or newspaper articles, you know, whatever it is, any, any words that are coming in and out, I, I constantly kind of have my antenna up. I've commissioned uh, quite a few composers, and that's always the biggest challenge is agreeing on text or having a text when you start with. The last was uh, Gwyneth Walker. We, we, we had, I commissioned a five-movement work for her, and she uh, it took us forever to find the text that she hadn't set and that she wanted to set, and, and that was a back-and-forth conversation for almost a year and a half before we uh, solidified on a text that like, she found music in. And I really like the way you talk about that finding music in the words. That's a very powerful image. Yeah, I fully support you and Gwyneth going back and forth for that long. Uh, I think that's really important. Um, it's important for you because if, if you're laying out that kind of investment, um, commissions are a place where you're paying for a product that you can't see. And I, I really struggle to find any parallel in all of the rest of life where you would pay actually that much money, whatever you know a composer's rate is, that somebody would pay that for something that they have no idea how it's going to turn out. So there's so much trust that's got to happen there. And that's part of the trust is past work, of course, but part of the trust is the communication up front. So that's really important. And I think it's so important for the composer too, because um, if they just write whatever, oh, here's this idea that my commissioner has, okay, I'll write it. <laughs> you just became a mercenary. You know, you'll fight whatever battle you're paid to fight. And you know, your heart may not be in it. You're just, you know, it, it, it may not be true. It may not be music of integrity. It may not be honest musically to who you are. So I think it's really important for composers to to work hard with uh, commissioning conductors to find something that really works for both, where, where the Venn diagram sort of overlaps. You've got to find that spot in the middle. And if it takes a year and a half, then so I'd, I'd rather hear the piece that you guys came up with after a year and a half than, than something that you just threw at her or that she threw at you. I, I think that's really important, in case you can't tell. <laughs> So when you started, uh, when you made the transition to uh, composer, what, what, did, what was your first, some of your first experiments in the composition field? And how old were you when you started composing? Um, I actually have my first piece. I, let me grab it. I didn't have it right here at the computer. Cool. <laughs> Pardon me for going off camera for a Absolutely. second. Absolutely. This is cool. Yeah, so this is um, in fourth grade. Um, the first year that I took piano lessons, um, I had the most wonderful piano teacher who, um, it was just a, a very small private Christian school, you know, probably 15, 20 kids in my little class, and that was it. Um, but she was outstanding. And even in my method books for piano, I had to practice every piece, uh, counting out loud, singing the letter names, and singing the words <laughs> to every piece. And I couldn't pass the piece until I could do all three really well. Wow, great um, teacher. Oh, so, I mean, it was oral skills in fourth grade, you know? Um, and so I have this little notebook that, uh, I'll show you my, my name on the cover here where it says Danny Forrest, right? And you can see the little uh, pine tree that I drew, a little bit of branding, <laughs> even in uh, fourth grade. And uh, on this page, which is dated, I think, May of 1987, you see her little writing there that says, make up a, a short song in each meter, at least four measures. And uh, so, so here's my little song for, in, from fourth grade. You ready? Here it goes. Sorry, let me turn that up. You know, so it's not going to win any Grammys, but there's a lot to be said for it. <laughs> there's, a, there's contrary motion, there's counterpoint, I mean, it, there's a lot of two voice kind of stuff that um, the intervals actually make pretty good sense in terms of counterpoint. So, I mean, that's how you learn as a composer, you mimic. You, and I've been playing lots of probably Clementi or something, and it kind of sounds like bad Clementi. <laughs> um, so yeah, there it is. And um, my, my teacher did give me at the top there, very good. Aww. <laughs> uh, so it's a nice affirmation there. From I the beginnings, that. we water that tree, and over time, it blossoms and grows into incredible things. Is your teacher, your your former teacher, still with us? Um, did you just make a tree joke to Dan Forrest? <laughs> okay, sorry. I did not plan that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm always on the lookout for those. Um, no, she did water the tree beautifully. Um, she passed away um, just a few years ago, but I stayed in touch with her over the years. I dedicated a couple of books, uh, collections of like piano arrangements to her. Um, and I was able to thank her deep. 
And uh, her name is in my bio, like on my website at the very end. I, I recently added a section. I think it's, I've been so impressed recently how important it is to acknowledge who's shaped me, who's molded me, who invested in me. So her name is on there. That's really important. That's a great anyway, tribute yeah, to, that, a, to a wonderful educator and the importance of that, those foundational skills that the, these people instill. And we never know the effects as teachers, what's going what's gonna to come of that fruit that we, that we plant, those trees that we plant. If we're going to continue the tree metaphors of the whole episode. <laughs> yeah. I mean, there was little Danny Forrest, you know, in 1987, fourth grade. And uh, I didn't know I was going to make a living at this. I I liked playing the piano and that was it. And you know, whether your student um, goes full time and gets some measure of recognition like I have, or whether your student just blesses the people around them by being able to gather around a piano and sing or, or to participate in some, you know, there's, there's all kinds of ways that, that you harvest <laughs> from what you planted. So that's really important. That's my first little piece. Um, most of what I wrote early on was piano. Um, in, it wasn't until college that I started writing for choirs, got more interested in that. Um, during my master's degree was my first published piece, um, a, a not very great arrangement of a, a hymn that I published with Beckenhorst. It's my first uh, church choral piece. Um, and back then, it didn't matter if your piece was not even super because you could still sell a lot of choral music. <laughs> and it was right after that that everything kind of turned down. But I got in right on the tail end of like those glory days of, of church choral publishing. Boy, Beckenhurst has had such a great tradition. We had, um, um, who's our founder? John, John Nesbeck he came to Ocean Grove way, way before my time there. I, was, I, came, oh. I, I came there in 2006, but he came in the 90s or in the 80s, I believe. But what, what a great tradition he built and a great body of music. We still do a bunch of his uh, anthems at Ocean Grove, some of the more traditional um, ones. I'm glad to hear that. Yeah, I mean, he, I didn't even know what Beckenhorst was growing up. Um, I don't know if I accidentally accompanied any Beckenhorst pieces in high school or something, but um, between John Nussbeck and then him passing the torch on to Craig Courtney, who of course still is very active and composing and conducting or whatever, um, and then Craig bringing me alongside uh, in 2012. I'm, I'm really glad to be a part of that tradition, especially for the way that it overlaps between church uh, choral repertoire and, and just good choral repertoire for concert situations or school or whatever. I, I mean, I, I have one foot in both those worlds, and Beckenhorst is a perfect place for me to bring those together and to, to write things that work for, for concert pieces, but are spiritual enough to be used in a worship kind of setting as well, or more um, spiritual texts or, or religious texts in some way, but set with enough craft that they work in a concert setting as well. I love that overlap. It's where I want to be. So when you, uh, you had your first piece published, it was a choral piece. Did that inspire you to continue that? And to, you, were, you were inspired by, by the people you worked with there to continue that. Um, when did you write your first uh, more extended piece? Uh, the church anthems are wonderful. But when did you start writing the, um, the more substantial multi-movement works that you're known for? Um, as part of my doctorate, I wrote a couple pieces. Um, part of my, um, I think my first year of my doctorate, which was 2004, I wrote Words from Paradise which are five um, a cappella settings, each of which is just one word, um, repeated and, and layered in various ways. And that set is maybe 23 minutes, 20 minutes, something like that, um, but very difficult. It's some of the hardest music I've published, some of those movements at least. Um, so that was the kind of the acad academic side coming out. And then in 2005, Hinshaw accepted those for publication, which was a huge so I, I had sent them many pieces over the years and didn't really have my finger on what they were looking for. Um, but those pieces, I sent them the manuscripts and the recording, and they loved it. And uh, Bill Carroll called me and accepted those five and a sixth piece, uh, a Basque lullaby, that I had sent. He's like, yeah, we'd like to accept all six of these. <laughs> I was like, what? Six wow. for the price of one? This is amazing. So from there is where I started branching out into uh, concert music more visibly, even though I had been writing some behind the scenes. Um, my first extended, well, I, I, my doctoral dissertation, that was 2007. Um, it's never been performed to be as a, it was a, a stepping stone piece, not a, a, it was a means, not an end. And that's fine. Um, in 2010, I wrote, um, a Tadeum setting, uh, for Ed Wilmington at, at his commission. Um, and that's, uh, 18, 20 minutes or so with orchestra. 
And then 2012, uh, I stopped teaching on a Friday in May and then started writing my Requiem the following Monday. <laughs> I just, I had to clear out the, that space in my life and in my head um, to where I could just go all in. And then that was what came out when I was able to go all in. It's the, the results have spoken for themselves, thankfully. Yeah, having an academic position like you had, you know, must make a huge difference in your ability to put out. To, how do you um, structure your schedule, your daily schedule to write? Um, how does that work for you? I've, I've always asked this question. I'm fascinated by how, how different these two wind up being from composer to composer. Yeah, um, at least at this stage of my life, um, doing my daily responsibilities is one giant game of whack-a-mole. <laughs> Whatever pops its head up is most needy right now. I beat that down, and then something else pops up. And so between um, we we have three kids, and we homeschool them. So taking care of that, and then um, composing, of course, and then um, publishing some of my own music um, on the concert side that I do these days, and taking care of all the business aspects and marketing aspects and licensing and whatever all of that, and then working for Beckenhorst as well, which is pretty much a full time job these days in terms of producing music and editing and working through submissions and putting out demos and answering licensing questions and trying to innovate and make the website better all the time and all the stuff that goes along with that. And then um, I recently took on the um, position as chair of the National ACDA Composition Initiatives Committee. So there's responsibilities on that front, keeping that moving, especially during this pandemic time. And then on top of that, I have like a quarter time job at my church as artist in residence as well. So um, whichever of those is popping their head up at the moment, I try to take care of it and I fit in the composing when I'm inspired in between those things. Um, if I have a piece that's going well and I, I feel confident that I have the right ideas and they need to be worked, then I'll get up early and I'll try to work uh, for 30 to 75 minutes in the morning before my kids come down for breakfast and then maybe here and there through the day as well. Um, but I do so much work just on like pre-composition, um, just gathering ideas and holding ideas at arm's length until I feel confident that I've settled on the right idea that I want to commit to. Um, that's kind of ongoing all the time. So even if I'm driving or, um, you know, mowing the lawn or taking care of my kids homeschool, um, a little part of my brain is always somewhere else, just kind of working through ideas and testing things and um, I'm trying not to do that right now. <laughs> As a father of four, I can relate. Um, the whack-a-mole analogy is a very good one. My oldest is 21, my youngest is 16, and we have uh, three birthdays coming up this weekend. My twins were born the day before Halloween and my, my, oldest son was, my youngest son was born the day after Halloween. So this weekend is wow. a busy one in the Tram family. <laughs> Yeah. Oh, well, good for you, and I'm glad you understand. Are your are your are your kids younger? Or are they um, how how old are they? Um, they are currently 16, almost 17, uh, 15, and 11. Yeah, so you got the older generation. Yeah, I've got 21 to 16, so it's a yeah. constant whack-a-mole. That's a good one. Yeah, and then balancing your 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 writing and your administrative positions that must be a constant uh, a constant uh, shuffle for which one gets the prominence and I guess when deadlines are due that must be uh, constantly a shuffle. It is, um, but I I love everything that I do. I I'm not committed to any job that I'm not passionate about or that I I wish I weren't. Um, everything that I mean I've chosen those things really carefully because there's a lot of other voices that call to me. But those are all really worthwhile and things that I'm passionate about and feel like it's where my um, gifts or, or work ethic or potential um, overlaps with a need that I, that I think I can fill, that I, that I want to try to fill at least. Um, so, yeah, it, it's all very good. And I have times where I go very administrative and I just kind of put the music on pause. And then there are times where people are saying, Dan, what are you, um, are you going to send me there? And I've just kind of disappeared because the piece is going really well. <laughs> like, I'm not going to come up for air. I'm just going to stay down here and work. But I keep at, it all. Good. At this point in your career, uh, how big is your catalog? If you had to guess, just. Um... I really need to count up the number of titles on my my Coral Works page on my website. I don't I don't know how many it is. I would guess it's maybe around a hundred, something like that. Uh, it might be more. It might be a little less. I'm I'm just not sure. And the thing is, a work could be Jubilate Deo, which is seven movements and over fifty minutes. 
for chorus and orchestra, or it could be a little, you know, three minute choral acapella miniature. So it, it's kind of hard to put a, a number on. Now, how exciting is it to watch a work that you you create and come to life in front of your eyes? I know you you have there's so many great recordings of, of many of your pieces. You can see them online, or what, what's it like to you when you see choirs all over the world these days performing your music? Uh, it's it's thrilling, and it's something that I couldn't have seen coming um, ten years ago, twenty years ago. I I would have had no idea. I, in those days, I was just sort of hoping to be a good pianist and maybe teach piano and maybe perform a little bit. And when I started composing, I remember times when my biggest aspiration was just to get a piece performed at my university. <laughs> like, oh, I wish somebody would do a piece, and you know, just just anything. I remember the first time I heard a choir sing through a choral piece that I had written. Um, it was not a good piece. It's not in print anywhere. It was just a kind of a, a poor attempt at doing something. But that very first time <laughs> that that other people used their instruments, their voices, to bring to life some ideas that I had come up with, I thought I had just died and gone to heaven. <laughs> and um, these days, it, it's a little less overwhelming because I think my aural imagination is stronger. So I know what I'm going to get when I write a piece, uh, at least a lot more. I'm still learning, lifelong learner, always learning from every piece and, and every rehearsal and every moment. Um, but I, I have a better sense of, of how it's going to work these days. So it's not quite such a shock when I hear it. But I still have moments. Um, I remember the first time I heard an out, a, a really fine choir rehearse the Requiem. Um, it was after, uh, it was early on. It, it wasn't in print yet. Um, and I got to go to their rehearsal. And they got to the, the point in the first movement when it really opens up and pours out and I just kind of sat back in my seat and thought, wow, where did this come from? It's, it's almost like when you have a baby, you know, and I'm like, how did that, how did, how did new life form? And, and I can't even explain this. And, you know, it, it just felt so, so overwhelming. So I love those moments. Um, and I, and I, I'm thrilled by them these days. Um, my, my biggest thrill really is just to see people in, in places that I haven't been or wouldn't have ever dreamed that I would connect with, just respond to my music in whatever ways, whether they're comforted by it or, or encouraged or um, inspired musically or um, talked off the ledge, so to speak. I mean, the, the kinds of things that I get in my email inbox are just mind bogglingly wonderful. And I have down days as a composer, for sure. There are days when I'm discouraged and I feel like none of my ideas are any good and I don't know where, how I'm going to write another piece. Um, and then somebody sends some little note like that. And I think, Doggone it, I'm going to go keep trying. You know? <laughs> and uh, sooner or later it happens. So That's wonderful. We have our first question from the, uh, from the audience. Uh, this is Marlene from Tennessee. And she asks, um, what's it like to set a text like the Requiem, which is so uh, every major composer is set Requiem text. Is it, is it overwhelming? Is it, um, what do you feel when you take, a, take on a text like that? It's sobering. That would be the word. Yeah. Um, as I, I mentioned earlier, I want to set text, not use it. Um, so to the extent that I, I see my job as, as mining musical ideas out of the text, however that happens, and nobody can fully explain that, but composers do that thing somehow. Um, to the extent that that's the way I operate, then it's, it's really sobering to try to find music that lives up to the weight of a text like that, whether it's the Requiem or... Um, I've had several other texts over the years where if I'm setting something that's just so profound and, and venerable um, and something with such a long history and tradition of, of wonderful settings where I feel like I need to contribute something worthwhile to the repertoire and not just write something that, that falls short. You know, if I can't write something worthwhile, I don't need to set this text. We should sing somebody else's setting. You know, <laughs> we don't need poor some, or more settings or poor settings. Like it needs to be worthwhile. So the weight of that burden um, can almost be crushing at times, but it can also be inspiring. Um, and if I'm just patient with it, that's the thing. If I take my time and wait to commit to the right idea, then I, I find it really rewarding. Wonderful. Who are some of your, um, your, your, um, your biggest influences, if you had to say some of your influence as a composer, some, some of your favorite musicians who you might still draw in, maybe early on in your career draw influence from or that continually provide influence or, or just a grounding for you as an artist? 
Yeah, so so many things I could point to there. Um, in terms of, of composer teachers, um, uh, some of my early college teachers, Joan Pinkston and Dwight Gustafson, just kind of gave me a taste for, for what was possible and um, just early honing. Um, Alice Parker is just a, a national treasure, um, and I am so proud to call her a, a, a strong influence um, on me uh, as a musician. Um, I just... I'm so thankful for her and love her dearly. Um, my doctoral teacher, James Barnes, um, probably influenced me about as much as anybody in my career and maybe the most. Um, and I don't think I even realized it at the time. Um, but shortly after I finished my degree, I realized just what a wealth of musicianship he had imparted to me. He's not really a choral composer, um, but his just his musicianship, he could look at a choral piece of mine and he wasn't going to fuss about breath or passaggio or whatever. He was just going to look at it and think about just looking at it musically. Like, does it work? Is it too long? Does it ramble? What needs to be tightened up? Where is the counterpoint weak? Where is the texture bad? Where is the harmonic progression awkward? Or, you know, all those kinds of things. As far as um, examples for me, um, the, the person I probably most point to would be John Rutter. Um, simply for the sake that, one, it was some of his music that really pulled me away from the piano and into the choral world, listening to Cambridge Singers' recordings and listening to what was possible. I was like, Such yes. amazing that recordings that that choir. Yeah. I was like, this is what I was trying to see the piano and never could. So why am I dinking around with the, with the piano? I want to be where the singing is. You know? um, and it, I've sort of come full circle on that now. My, my best moments are collaborating from the piano, you know, accompanying a choir on my pieces. But... Um, also the way that he, um, kind of spreads the gamut between church and concert, between simple and really usable and much more, um, complicated or challenging. Um, I, I like that as a model. Um, and I, I think there's great like hybridization and cross influence that happens between those that's important. And then, uh, lastly, these days in terms of listening, I actually don't listen to a lot of choral music. I try to listen to it enough. So I sort of know what's going on in the field. But I, I don't want to latch on to any composer and, and start uh, just copying them because I don't have a lawsuit. <laughs> or, or at the least, uh, people will be like, oh, yeah, Forrest, he just sounds like so-and-so these days. You know? So I'm trying to just feed and, and soak up um, in a lot of other places besides choral music. So um, recently, uh, two most recent composers I've been listening to are probably uh, Max Richter. There's a lot of like really uh, modern kind of post-minimalism uh, maybe sort of film score kind of things that he does um, that aren't choral necessarily, but I love his aesthetic and the, the subtle detail, even in his minimalist type things. Um, and then recently I got on the, uh, the Coldplay album. <laughs> What's, uh, what is that? Everyday Life or something like that. I don't even remember the name. There's a couple songs in there that just blew me away. Um, and, it, you know, I'm not necessarily listening for a chunk of melody that I can use or a new harmonic progression that I haven't heard before. It's more just like how he's communic how any of these ensembles are communicating what the music is saying, how they're saying it, issues of texture or form or pacing. You know, I'm trying to glean from from all of that more than I am just trying to listen to something choral that I can use. You know? Certainly, at this point in your career, there's no new choral progressions or chord. That's all been explored. But it's amazing how their music, uh, it just deepens and broadens. Even when you take something like a Coldplay album, something that's popular in, in, in rock and roll and conception, and it, you, know, you find how, ex how, how directly that, that popular music can express feelings. I think there's a great depth to that as well. Yeah, I, I'm really choosy about pop music. Um, there's plenty of Coldplay that would not ever make it into my uh, Apple Music playlist. Um, but just certain things just flip my switch. And boy, it's really something. And there's a great energy in rock and roll. I think when you go to these days, there are no live performances. But when you go to a live rock performance, it's um, it can really there's an, a visceral energy in that that um, that I find that you know that classical musicians when they when they connect to that energy, it really is great to grab the audience's attention and to you know move an audience. Mm, I can't say that I've actually ever been to a rock concert, <laughs> but maybe I should try it sometime. My son's a uh, very uh, serious young drummer, and he's in a rock. He plays, uh, he tours with a rock group, and he travels. And I, I get to hear some really some rock music. Ear protection is a must at these things, and uh, <laughs> yeah. 
<laughs> but I, uh, yeah, I enjoy it. But it's a, I like the, the well-rounded. I also grew up in opera, so opera to me is, is always loud. I'm in the pit with an opera orchestra. You have to get an orchestra and the singers on the stage. And uh, we were always rehearsing in a small room. That's a, <laughs> <laughs> And the singers are next to me, you know. These days, though, apparently with, uh, with COVID, uh, opera is going to have to take a pause for these days as we yeah. reset and come back to uh, what that's going to be like afterwards. Let's segue uh, shamelessly into COVID and the, the times we find ourselves now. Um, how has that deepened your composition? Have you, um, how does the, the, the challenges we are all facing as a society, how does that manifest in your art? Um, my first response to COVID um, was that my schedule was just wiped out. I had all this travel lined up for the spring and for the summer and commitments, um, lost all of those trips, they're all gone, of course, um, lost some commissions that were associated with some of those trips, uh, lost two trips to Europe, um, in, including a large premiere that was supposed to happen over there that's been delayed for a year. So I have, I have this really, this piece that I'm excited about, it's 15 minutes long, that I was gonna be excited about sharing this summer and now I'm waiting for next summer, but hopefully that'll happen. Um, yeah, so everything just, just cleared out. And once the dust settled from all that, I realized that what I had on my hands was just an opening, uh, some space that I hadn't had in probably a decade. <laughs> so I really made the most of it and just took a little bit of a sabbatical. And it was really refreshing and healthy um, and, and invigorating in a lot of ways. Um, so for the first couple months, I planted a garden in my backyard. <laughs> um, pictures of that are on social media with uh, hashtag forest gardens, um, two R's in forest. So look for that hashtag and you can see some of my uh, landscaping work there. What did you grow? Uh, um, it, it's uh, like landscape gardens more oh, than vegetable gardens. Okay. So okay. there's a kind of a uh, European kind of British country garden kind of feel with stone walls and uh, uh, pea gravel pathways and a large water feature and uh, a bridge and all, all kinds of things. So that's kind of my happy place. Um, that's how I balance out the music work. It's the total opposite side of my brain to just go out there and dig in the dirt. <laughs> um, and I also see the results of my work so immediately there. Whereas with music, I, I spend a, a month or two thinking about what I'm going to do with a piece and then another month writing it and then wait a few months to hear it um, maybe recorded or premiered or something, and then wait longer for it to go into print, for other choirs to find it. It's just such a, a glacial process. Um, whereas if I go out and, and plant flowers or, or, or shrubs, I, I finish at the end of the day and things look nice. you know. And so the, it, it really balances things out well. Once all that cleared out, though, it, um, it became clear that the pandemic was going to go on longer, <laughs> just those couple months. So I, I had to get back to, to writing music. It was hard to do that, for sure. Um, I think because I write music best when everything is just status quo and settled and calm. Everything else is in its proper place and where it should be. And then I had kind of have the luxury of just diving down to my musical place, you know, and, and trying to dream up notes. So when, when the world is in upheaval and there's a pandemic, that kind of turmoil, and when there's racial unrest and George Floyd's murder and all those um, associated things that were going on, and, um, all the political unrest and bickering and partisanship and difficulty, you know, all that stuff, that's, that's, uh, it, it made it difficult to write for sure. But in the middle of all that, what I found myself wishing for was Shalom, which I, I think you opened the, the show with here. Um, and I just wanted to write a piece that set um, words of comfort and um, that, that Hebrew wish for peace, shalom. Um, so that was the first piece that I wrote after uh, a few months of quarantine and, um, and pandemic response and everything that's been going on. And uh, I, would, I hope that that is a piece that um, provides comfort for people and, and helps them find a place of peace uh, the, the Hebrew word for shalom is so much broader than just the like surface level, shallow of peace, you know, hope everything goes okay. You know, it's so much richer than that. It, it's holistic and all encompassing um, fruitfulness and flourishing and wholeness, a, a lack of, um, of fragmentation or segmentation or, or being pulled apart in any way. It's just that everything comes together and, and is whole um, uh, physically, emotionally, spiritually, relationally. 
relationship with others, a relationship to God, a relationship even to ourselves, that all of that, that comes together and, and is whole and is at one. So I tried to write music that as simply and directly as possible could communicate that idea. Um, I, I feel like the, the piece came out the way I wanted it to. Everybody else can judge whether it, it says the right thing or not, but it, it, it says what I was trying to say, and, and I hope it, it resonates with people. It was incredibly heartfelt, and it was. It's great to hear the um, how how much that meant to you, and how much I mean that's going to mean to so many people as that gets traveled around the world, and different choirs are get exposed to that. Yeah, earlier in the show, I said that I often don't write from a place where I am. I just write from where I think other people may may be and what they'll need at that moment. But in this case, the, all that came together. It really was how I felt at the moment, and it was what I needed at the moment. Just not just what everybody else might need. Um, and, and usually if it speaks to, to me and what I needed, then it, it speaks to other people as well. So I'm glad for that. There's a way that I'm, I'm glad to not always just be kind of stoic and kind of absolutist, but to be more programmatic and, and connected. And um, I, I'm glad for pieces that come out that way. I think in these incredibly emotional and difficult times, all the cognitive dissonance that uh, I think it's both, right? I mean, um, sometimes we we have our we have our jobs and we do our work, and then there's these things that we just can't avoid, and we have to, you know, as expressive people, as artists, we have to just put our put it out there. Yeah, for sure. Um, the the second piece that I wanted to mention too is a piece called Fermata. Hmm. Um, that's a piece that uh, the text was sent to me. <laughs> you asked how, where texts come from. Um, there was, there's a choir in, I think, I believe it's in Boston, um, that was rehearsing my requiem, and then the rehearsals stopped, of course, and they had to cancel their dress rehearsal and their performances, and it was all put on pause. So uh, one of the choir members, who is <laughs> such a gifted poet as well, um, wrote just a poetic reflection on this pause, this, this fermata um, where we wait. Um, and just questioning where did this long pause begin, and when we when we return, where will we start? How can we find our place? Um, and then in the second half, it says, "I cannot find the the measure where we went silent, mm. but the notes know where they are, suspended above us in a holding pattern, waiting for a trusted hand to guide us into the downbeat." Isn't that the oh. truth? Isn't that the what truth? The so I set that as a five-part canon. It was kind of my compositional challenge for the summer, for the like the brainy side of what I do. Um, and man, canons are hard. Uh, but I, I found, uh, after a lot of work and a lot of study and, and growth, hopefully, as a composer, um, I found a way to, to set that. So there, it's just a single line of melody on the page, and you can do it in up to five different parts that imitate each other. Um, and then I made it available for free. It, it's uh, free to the, the global choral community. Um, so there's a there's a page for it on my website at danforest.com. And then the actual download where you can get the piece is at, at the Beckenhorst website where my concert music is distributed. Um, so that's uh, beckenhorstpress.com. Um, if you look up Fermata on that page, you can pay a little bit of money if you want, but you're welcome to have it for free. Um, just take it and use it and um, find comfort and, and solace in it. Um, and then that kind of um, was the first piece in a series of pieces that ACDA has put out now through our committee, um, just ad asking other composers if they want to do the same. And some other people, I think, had already had similar ideas. So we've shared, um, I don't know, maybe 15 different composers' pieces now for free, available on there. And they've been vetted. You know, it, it's not just like hack music that's, you know, like, oh, I'll just devil something. It's, oh, it's, it's worthwhile stuff um, that's up there. So yeah, hopefully that's a, a blessing to people and um, provides some encouragement and shines a little light in what's otherwise a, a dark time. What advice do you have for young composers? We have a lot of young young, music, young musicians and artists on this that watch the show. What advice do you have for people coming up in this time of COVID? I, a mutual colleague of ours, Joe Martin, was on the show and he said, this is a great time to be a composer. Not a great time to be a music publishing, but a great time to be a composer. And uh, as, as everything's on pause, as we talked about, and we're fermataing. Uh, what advice do you have for people coming up today? Um, kind of my standard answer to that, whether pandemic or not, um, is just to do anything that you can do that develops your musicianship. Um, I think a lot of times composing gets segmented from broader musicianship. And uh, it, it seems to people, I think wrongly, that 
um, working on conducting or improving your ear or your aural skills or your sight singing or taking a class in music history or understanding counterpoint or um, studying your instrument or collaborating, you know, whatever all the, the possibilities are musically. It seems like, oh, but anyway, how do I be a composer? And the answer is all of that stuff that I just listed off feeds your, your compositional skill because the best composers are the best musicians. So the, the deeper and broader your, your musicianship goes, the more knowledge and experience and tools you have from which to write music that will, that will work <laughs> for the conductor, for the performers, um, and, and even connect to the audience as well. And then the other thing I'd say is just do lots and lots of listening, but do that listening thoughtfully. Um, I, I used to find in my students that, um, you know, you'd assign a, a listening assignment for them and they would just kind of let the, the sound wash bathe over them and they would they thought they had listened to the piece now. And, I mean, that, that's not listening, that's, that's hearing, <laughs> but it's not listening, there's a huge difference. Um, yeah, so, so Stravinsky said that there's no, um, what did he say? There was no uh, joy, there's no uh, skill in just hearing a duck hears. <laughs> I love that. Yeah, a duck. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so listening with understanding and, and trying to figure out what makes this piece tick. How does it work? How does it speak? What is its style? What does it say? Um, does it say what the composer intended? Does it say something different? Where? How do I account for that difference? Why is that? Um, what might I have done differently for better or for worse? You know, all those kinds of questions, let alone listening to instrumentation and, and form and, and pacing and structure. Um, so many things to, to try to engage. And I think that's where the best learning comes from. And then if you can get a score as well, then you can see how that composer communicated that music. Um, and the music, of course, is not in the score. The score is just a convenient aid to memory. Um, Alice Parker would have a lot to say about that, right? Um, but it, it's a starting point, and it's how the composer communicated. It's, it's a letter that, that tells every person who's involved in that performance exactly what that composer wants and how he or she would like them to contribute their part. Um, and that art of basically like reading those letters from composers to performers and seeing how they communicate, how do they try to capture those ideas? How do they look on the page? How much detail do they use? Um, and not to mention issues of scoring and, and well, all the other stuff I talked about. Um, that so much to be learned there. I, I think that's some of the very best um, compositional learning that you can do, even if you're not like taking lessons or something. We can all grow that way. I'm Absolutely. still growing. Absolutely, it's a lifetime being a composer. I imagine just like being a conductor is a lifelong engagement. There's always different different avenues to explore, whether it be the text or whether it be different. Uh, different uh, musical um, veins but we keep on doing that as we um, as we deepen our relationship with the art form we have one last question from the audience uh, this is from uh, Fred from Los Angeles and he asks um, let's see if I get this right here here we go is um, do you compose on paper or do you compose on the computer first it's a tricky answer I I don't use pencil and paper anymore um, I use the computer, but I use the computer the way that pencil and paper type composers use pencil and paper. <laughs> so it's uh, it's not a sense of, um, oh, let's press playback, and now I know what my piece sounds like. No, you don't. Like Your computer is lying to you all the time about, about so many things. So it, it doesn't replace aural imagination. And just because I'm sketching notes on the computer doesn't mean that they're set in stone or that they're locked in place or that I can't like use an eraser, so to speak, you know, so I would like to think that I accomplish with the computer, the same things that people who would say like, you can't write on a computer, you got to use pencil and paper. And you know, there are people that feel very strongly about that. And I understand why, but I think I'm able to use the computer computer successfully and without succumbing to some of the problems that, that can come with it. So yes, computer, but with a really big asterisk by it. <laughs> so for the record, you save a lot of trees that way. <laughs> Indeed. <laughs> well played. <laughs> well, so Dan, how can we find out more? How can people find out more about your work to keep uh, up with what you're, what you're working on? And uh, where would you send people to get more information on you as a person and on, as a composer? Yeah, my website is uh, danforest.com. There are two R's in danforest.com. And if you forget the second R, you will promptly go to a politician in North Carolina. Oh no. <laughs> I get his hate mail 
Oh, I literally wow. had someone write me and say, how much money have I contributed to your campaign? Because I want to send you the max, and I don't know if I'm at the max yet. So I wrote her back and said, yeah, you have a long ways to go. Here's the end. No, I didn't do that. <laughs> I promise I didn't do that. <laughs> I write all of them back and say, you need the Dan Forrest with one R. And how did you think that that picture on my website was a politician? Because I'm sitting at the piano, like longingly looking into the distance, thinking about music. <laughs> anyway, danforrest.com, two R's. Um, there's a page there. Um, under like my works list, there's a whole page that has all of my choral output listed there and it's searchable and it's sortable by, or filterable by publisher, by style, by season, by event, by instrumentation. Um, it's, it's designed to be as helpful as possible for conductors looking for repertoire. Um, I also have a pretty strong presence at the Beckenhorst website because I publish my church anthems with Beckenhorst Press. And then even though I self-publish my concert music these days, it's distributed through the Beckenhorst Press system and is, is on their website. So I'm, all of my eggs are in that Beckenhorst basket these days. And it's nice to just have everything in one place in terms of where you buy my music. Of course, you can buy it from your favorite local retailer as well. Um, that works perfectly fine. And then uh, if you want to get to know me personally better, you're welcome to follow me on uh, Facebook or Twitter or Instagram. I uh, have a personal and public page on Facebook. Um, the personal page is more me. The public page is all music. Um, and then Twitter is just a, it's an automated copy of whatever I put on Facebook. I don't actually engage much there, truth be told. And then Instagram is mostly pictures of my garden. Wow. <laughs> so if that's what you're into, then knock yourself out. Well, I thank you so a, much for joining us, Dan, and um, continued success in all of your activities. Uh, one of the leading composers of your generation, and um, we, I look forward to, um, to engaging with your music and to uh, seeing what you produce, which uh, is going to enrich the lives of thousands and thousands of us, and uh, thank you. Oh, you're very kind. I'm, I'm so thankful for the opportunity. I was going to just tack on really quickly. Um, I do have a Christmas piano album that yeah. I recorded uh, yesterday, in fact. That Congratulations. We're putting out right now so you can look for that on uh, Apple Music or Spotify or all the normal platforms um, in a few weeks for the Christmas season it'll come out so even if you're not able to make choral music right now we can uh, share some Christmas cheer together thank you for what you're doing Jason uh, and thank you we continued success so, and uh, I look forward to hearing uh, more great music to come very good Thank you for joining us on Music Matters 2020. Please remember to subscribe to us and help us grow our community and continue to uh, 